What does the Russian invasion of Ukraine teach us about gun rights? Join Richard Eveline and me in this week's Libertarian Angle as we examine that question. Hi, I'm Jacob Hornberger, president of the Future of Freedom Foundation, and this is this week's Libertarian Angle, the show here on the internet that brings you the principled and compromising case for the libertarian philosophy, for the free society, the private property order, limited government. And I'm joined by my co-host, Richard Eveline, professor of economics at the Citadel, whose friendship with me goes back, oh gosh, all the way down to our Dallas days in the late 1980s. Richard, good to see you again. Good to see you too. Is it was that the 1980s or the 1880s? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm fairly certain it was the 1980s. Okay. Uh, anyway, thanks for tuning in, uh, as y'all are customarily doing here at Libertarian Angle. If you're new, though, come and visit us at fff.org. Subscribe to our FFF Daily, which we strive to make the best daily libertarian commentary page on the internet. Our monthly journal, Future of Freedom. This YouTube channel. So, Richard, let me, you know, we, we've, we've talked about the Russian invasion of Ukraine and, you know, we've written about it. So let me let me read you a quote that I, I saw in the mainstream press regarding what's going on in Ukraine. Outside of a police station on Saturday afternoon, men are lined up and down the street to register their names so that they can go through the first round of background checks to get a weapon. This is referring to Ukraine. Men of all ages in the capital have come out to register for a weapon in response to the Russian forces that are attacking Kiev. More men in the city are expected to register in the hours and days to come. Now, we've, we've addressed, of course, as libertarians, the matter of gun rights and gun control for the entire 32-year history of, of FFF. And obviously, as libertarians, we come solidly down in favor of gun rights and against gun control. Um, as we've often pointed out, well, since our inception, gun rights have nothing to do with, uh, with the right to shoot deer. Um, it has everything to do with the right of self-defense. And that self-defense is commonly understood to mean burglars and robbers and thieves and so forth. But as we libertarians know, that's not what the Second Amendment was oriented toward. The Second Amendment was oriented toward the right to defend yourself against the tyranny of your own government. That is to say that if your government becomes overly tyrannical, uh, it is the right of the people, as Jefferson pointed out in the Declaration of Independence, to alter or even abolish it. Well, abolishing generally means uh, with, with force, like a revolution. But in order to affect that kind of revolution, you need guns, you need weapons. Uh, it, it's often said that the... Uh, the disarmed society is the is the obedient society, because uh, since if government's the only entity that has the guns, you either obey its edicts, especially a tyrannical government, or you die. You get shot by the government or executed in some way. But here in Ukraine, we're being reminded of another factor here with respect to gun rights, that if pe in a society where people have gun rights, if you're ever invaded, you don't need to go and ask for permission of the government to give you a gun. The government isn't, doesn't have to say, you know, okay, well, let's take out all these guns we have in our warehouses and start doling them out to people who don't even know how to use them because you know, how would they know how to use them if they haven't been able to own them and practice with them? Um, but compare the United States to Ukraine. If anybody ever invaded the United States, which of course is a virtually non-existent possibility, but if it did happen, it would be like swallowing a porcupine. I mean, with all the people that own guns, you know, nobody would have to run to the government and say, oh, please let me register for a gun. Please let me have one. I mean, every, you know, how many millions of Americans have unbelievable stockpiles of weapons? So an invading army would have to be dealing with that, that type of guerrilla warfare. And that in itself would serve as a deterrent to invasion. And I, I, one of my favorite, excuse me, I'm having a little allergy attack here. One of my favorite um, examples of this is Switzerland. 
I mean, Switzerland, notice, does not get embroiled in all of these conflicts around the world. Uh, they, they, they don't send troops abroad. They don't intervene in other countries. They don't affect regime change operations and so forth. But they orient toward defense, real defense, genuine defense. Most everybody owns rifles, assault rifles in their homes. They're free to keep them in their homes. They train themselves or, or the government trains them. I mean, they're, they're well trained. I, I think every Swiss citizen is well trained in the use of a firearm so that if anybody ever, were ever to invade Switzerland, they might ultimately win. But boy, they would pay an enormous price in terms of the number of people that would be killed in that invading force. And that's one of the real reasons why Hitler could not invade Switzerland. He desperately wanted Switzerland so that he had easy connection between Italy, with whom Germany was aligned in World War II. But his advisor said, if you take that road, your army, you may win, and you probably will win, but your army is going to be decimated at the end of it. So here's another reason why we should resist the, the, the gun control status here in the United States. It's another, it, it, it's another way to, to, to disarm Americans in the event, as unlikely as it may be, of a foreign invasion of our country. What do you think? Well, I would correct one of the factual error that I think you made. The, 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 the Swiss do go abroad for foreign adventures. The, the Vatican has Swiss guards to hold back the aggressive Italian hordes that surround the Vatican. <laughs> Damn Swiss mercenaries. But obviously you're right about that in general. <laughs> anyway, but the thing is, is that, the, the you know, one of the things when the government knows things that in various situations it would be nice for them not to know is that when the, uh, when the German army invaded the Soviet Union in 1941, and began overrunning areas such as Belarus, uh, Ukraine, uh, they broke in or captured or overran police stations and the KG, the, the local KGB headquarters and offices in these places. And what did they find there? Everyone had to officially register with the government, not only where they work, but where they lived. And on these documents, it specified, well, was this person an ethnic Ukrainian? Was he a Russian? Was he a Belarusian? Was he Jewish? So it made it very easy for the, for, for the, for the Germans and then the Nazi vanguard that was with them to round up Jews to just say, well, let's just go to the local KGB office and find out where all the Jews are registered if, and to see if they're still there rather than having uh, attempted to, to escape. So once the government knows these things, it makes enemies have an upper hand to go after those who they view as meant for special targeting. And I, re I raise that because, as you're saying, uh, the, the, the Ukrainian government has been handing out, I believe, just in Kiev, close to 25,000 arms of one type or another, uh, if, I, if I remember the number right from that I've heard on the news. But as you are saying, they're requiring everyone to sort of register uh, before they're handed a gun. Well, um, trying to express this optimistically, let us suppose that uh, the Ukrainians do not succeed in warding off the Russian attack. That is, eventually, finally, no matter their best efforts, the Russians defeat the Ukrainian resistors. And now they've entered the capital city of Kiev or any other Ukrainian city or town where arms have been distributed in the same way and under the same requirements, they will find it very easy to, assuming the records have not been destroyed, to find out the names and the addresses of all the Ukrainians to whom the Ukrainian government has handed out these weapons. Now, uh, think about it during the, the uh, resistance movements in World War II. Uh, I'm sure that France, before the First World War, uh, had gun registration, and so I'm sure it made it easier for the occupying Germans to track down some people who had weapons, you know, hunting rifles or anything else. But once there was an underground, I don't think they were registered addresses and names <laughs> of everyone in the French underground as to what weapons and training and where they lived for, for, for a Gestapo raid 
to you know find some record of all of these things and just round up the resistance fighters in that simple and easy way. Uh, it was done without records, without government permission, uh, and often just capturing weapons from the Germans themselves when they succeeded in a raid. And they didn't report to the local Gestapo, well, I'm a local French resistance fighter, and I'm just making sure that you, the Gestapo, has given me a license to have this rifle. I mean, give, give me a break. So um, I think that this is a, a paradox. You, they want the people to resist but they're creating records that would make it easier for the Russians to track down the resistors. Um, and more importantly, as you're saying, is that obviously what they're thinking of at this moment is resisting a foreign invader. And certainly one purpose uh, under the first, uh, under the second Amendment uh, is for an armed citizenry to resist an attacker from the outside. Uh, that's how the American colonials viewed the, the British army after having declared their independence. It is now a foreign government and a foreign army attempting to suppress their desire to have this uh, personal freedom and political independence. Um, but it is, is, is the fact is that uh, let's suppose that the Russians do not just annex uh, Ukraine if they succeed in this, but set up a puppet government like Lukashenko in neighboring Belarus, you know, some hacky, hackney puppet. Then it would just be the, a, a Ukrainian government wishing to disarm their own citizens so as not to attempt to undermine that government that is neutrally friendly to Putin in Moscow uh, and therefore preventing any successful resistance to what is basically a puppet government. Uh, and and th that, that's one of the perversities of this, um, that, that a right to bear arms, and if you believe that individual rights are universal, uh, they're not something that by historical chance belongs to Americans, but no other human being on the face of the earth. But if you believe that certain rights are universal, then certainly the right of self-defense is too. And that includes the, the, the right to be armed, whether the government knows about it or approves of it, to a, against the aggressions of other private citizens or a, an attacking government, a foreign one certainly, but even your own. Yeah, you make some great points and it brings to mind you know, the background checks here in the United States that were implemented many years ago and to which uh, you know, many libertarians objected, including me, because it, pre it presents this record for the government uh, of who owns the guns. Uh, now, it, it, you know, let's give them some credit. They said that they, they, these records have to be destroyed after a certain period of time. Um, and presumably and hopefully they are so that the records are non-existent. But at least their statement that they're going to destroy the records acknowledges what you and I are talking about, that the people don't want to have the government to have lists of who has weapons, that if, if you have those lists, then it's not really a free and unfettered right, which is really what it is. It's, it's, it's as much a right as freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and all the other fundamental, natural, God-given rights that people have. And your point about the Russian army now being able to ferret out who has guns is excellent as well. Uh, I find it interesting that that the Ukrainian government, when, when they know that their backs are against the wall, that this regime isn't just handing out weapons to everybody. The fact that they're taking the time to make people fill out these forms with their name and address is just incredible. And I think the reason they're doing that is that in the unlikely event they were able to prevail against the Russian army, they would then summon all those people in and say, we want these weapons back. Well, you know, supposedly we keep being told that, you know, the Russians attacking this free country. Well, how can you have a free country where people are not free to own weapons, where they have to turn their weapons back in or it's by privilege? Um, and the, the other thing I, I find amusing is that they're saying that because this is a democratic nation, that the president was democratically elected, that that's freedom. Well, you and I have talked about that before. Democracy doesn't mean freedom. In fact, democracy can be sometimes your gravest threat to freedom. And, and I, I read, an, I mean, I saw an, uh, a short video by Tulsi Gabbard where she pointed out that uh, the, the Ukrainian regime was jailing journalists that were being critical of the regime. Well, how is that reconcilable with principles of freedom? 
Um, now, the, the, you know, the people would, would respond to us and say, well, there's no chance of uh, that kind of tyranny ever coming to the United States. You don't need your weapons to alter or abolish the federal government because it's democratically elected and it would never get so tyrannical that it would be necessary to do so. Well, and yet you have a national security establishment that has installed into power and supported some of the most brutal regimes in the world. Um, the Pinochet regime comes to mind. You know, they helped install that regime. They, they ousted a democratically elected president, so, so much for you know, democracy, and they, they did it with force. And uh, they installed this brutal military general that stays in power for 17 years that rounds up people for doing nothing more than believing in communism. He tortures them, or his goons torture them. They raped a lot of the women. And they supported this. I mean, the Pentagon and the CIA were, were ardent supporters of, of Pinochet. They, they thought the guy was doing great. Uh, we saw it with the Shah of Iran when they installed him into power and helped train his Sabak, which was a brutal domestic police force. So you, you've got this massive establishment in the United States that believes in this kind of tyranny, which they don't consider as tyranny. And the, the, the risk, of course, is that if the circumstances ever presented themselves here, and is that the military and the CIA, the national security establishment, would establish that kind of order here, ostensibly to protect Americans. And, and President Eisenhower alluded to this. I mean, you can say, oh, Jacob, that's, that's really going to an extreme. But here's the president of the United States, who is the former commander of Allied forces in, in World War II, a career military man, West Point graduate saying, this is the risk of this military industrial complex. It poses a grave threat to our rights and liberties. And we forget that at our peril. And that's one of the main reasons why gun, contr gun control is so horrific and why gun rights are so important. Well, let me sort of uh, elaborate on a couple of the things. One is uh, self-defense weapons can come in many forms. And I'm sure many of the viewers and listeners have seen on their news, watching the news shows, how Ukrainians seemingly all over the country are uh, uh, making and stockpiling the used quantities of Molotov cocktails, right? the, 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 the gasoline and other infla inflammables in bottles. Now, uh, has every one of these people who have been making Molotov cocktails have they requested a government license to be properly trained by a government supervisor on how to build a Molotov cocktail? Have, have, have they done an itinerary, an inventory list of how many such Molotov cocktails they're storing in their own home or apartment? Um, no. Uh, and that means that, uh, and again, I don't know if any of you saw this, I saw it on a Twitter feed uh, where Ukrainians were taking videos from their cameras. So in, in, in the city of Kharkov, some Russian vehicles, military vehicles, were going down the street in an apartment uh, neighborhood at night, so it was very visible with the flames. And they started flowing, throwing Molotov cocktails at the Russian military vehicles and set them on flame. Uh, should, should those people have registered their Molotov cocktails so in some way the Russians could find out where they were before they were thrown out the windows? Uh, the, the other thing about the United States, uh, there's a very famous novel from the 1930s by the writer Upton Sinclair called It Can't Happen Here. And it was the question, uh, I'm not particularly defending the novel, but it's the theme that, of it. Uh, it. It was the idea, you know, fascism could never come to America. You know, it can't happen here. And of course, what Sinclair was saying, and he was a lefty, because he had a different meaning of how he saw democracy in fascism than perhaps a classic liberal would understand these things. But he was saying dictatorship could, dictatorship could come to America. And uh, a dictatorship here could come under uh, many rhetorical covers as if it isn't dictatorship. It might even sound like it's Americanism when in fact it would be the opposite of a free, the free United States. And so the idea that it can't happen here, it can happen here. It's happened here in many other places under many rhetorical covers, and it has nonetheless been a tyranny and an oppression of the people and their liberty. Uh, and the US government has certainly shown in enough incidents, certainly over the last century, 
that they are willing to uh, violate civil liberties, arrest people because of the things that they say or write or seemingly think, uh, that they are willing to conscript people to fight in wars that those individuals may feel no sense is uh, a legitimate cause uh, to, to go and fight for. I'm thinking particular most most notoriously in the recent history of Vietnam. Uh, they they surveillance us. Um, they have the capacity to be reading every uh, keystroke on our computers to uh, wiretap and follow without without uh, 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 a court order. Uh, virtually everything we say over our uh, cell phones or those people who have landlines or things that are recorded on on the internet. Uh, they may seem secure, but they're not. Uh, and to say that it cannot happen here, that uh, under the right circumstances, all of this information that is available to and collected by and sifted through by various government officials, uh, usually by code words through you know artificial intelligence, you know subversive words like freedom or independence. Those are, those are, those are like like buzzwords for these you know AI programs that they use. Um, besides others that, you know, like terrorism or something. Uh, so if you if you think that the government doesn't have that capacity, doesn't utilize that capacity and could easily under the right circumstances use some or all of that capacity against the, the literal and, and clearly evident freedoms of the people of this country, then I think you really need to think twice. I'm, I'm not saying this is paranoid that tomorrow America is becoming a police state. But the institutional means are there because of what we allow government to do today that could easily lead to that undesired outcome. Yeah, and let me let me add to those dark side, omnipotent, totalitarian like powers, the power of assassination. I mean, you know, the, the framers expressly prohibited the power of assassination. That's what it means when it says you cannot deprive a person of life without due process of law. Due process of law means a notice, a trial, a hearing, um, and yet an assassination eliminates all that. And, and ever since the U.S. government was converted from a limited government republic, which was our founding governmental system, to a national security state after World War II, ostensibly to fight the so supposed communist threat, they have wielded this power of assassination. And the Supreme Court and the federal courts have deferred to them. You can't file a lawsuit trying to stop them from assassinating anyone. Uh, the, the, the federal courts have established that they're going to defer to the Pentagon and the CIA when they assassinate people um, or torture people. I mean, the, remember the Jose Padilla case where they, they were torturing Padilla, an American citizen. It was upheld by the federal courts. Uh, so these are, granted, being used rarely, but as we've pointed out, once they establish the principle and the precedent, then given the right crisis, the floodgates are open to do whatever they want, to, uh, including not just to foreigners, which w they have shown they have the propensity to do and the will to do, but to Americans as well. That is, Americans... That, who they consider a threat to national security. So in a, in a real crisis, all bets are off as to what's going on. Now, this is where the, the widespread gun ownership in America comes into play, though. They have to factor that into consideration. The would-be tyrant, before he crosses too many red lines, has to think, at what point are all these well-armed Americans going to say, no, you're not going to be doing this and you're not going to be doing that. You're not going to be, you know, doing what Pinochet's goons were doing, raping my sister or my wife or whatever. You're not going to be torturing my son or my daughter and that sort of thing. So, and they have the means to resist. If you don't have the means to resist, then it just becomes a matter of obedience. And I'm, I remember that scene from Braveheart where the newlywed couple is celebrating their marriage and that force of, uh, of troops comes along and the, the, the local Lord says, well, under the law, I have a, the right to sleep with your wife on your wedding, on her wedding night. And, and the, the, the husband starts to resist and they hold him back and she holds him back because it was no use. You know, they're, they're, they're not allowed to be armed. They can't fight against this, these soldiers. Well, in a well-armed society, 
that lawyer is going to think twice before he does something like that because people are going to resist, which, of course, is what ends up happening with Braveheart. He leads the resistance against that sort of tyranny. Now, I want to bring up another factor here, and that's about training. You know, there, uh, I was reading where some of these women have acquired these assault rifles and so forth and have no idea how, how to use them. I mean, they're being thrown to battle. Uh, Zelensky, President Zelensky of Ukraine is saying he's calling on all civilians to join the battle. But, I mean, where is the justice of throwing people into battle that haven't been trained? They're going against well-trained Russian troops. Now, under our system, where people are free to, to own guns, it is in the interest of a person who buys a gun, and, and the person who does buy a gun is usually going to get trained in how to use it. I mean, they're not just going to buy a gun for decorative purposes. So you've got women right now, a large number of women are buying guns and have been for several years now and learning how to use them. Uh, so that's another factor here, Richard, is that when you've got a well-armed and a well-trained citizenry, self-trained citizenry, then that only not only helps with respect to the tyranny problem here at home, it also helps with respect to an invasion problem. Yes. Um, you know, if, 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 if you have communities, and many people have firearms. And while the government may know through licensing who has it and where, as a private individual, you're unlikely to have access to that information, which means that burglars, thieves, possible murders, murders have to think twice before they break into any house as to whether the occupants of that residence have a lethal means of protecting themselves from that private individual's aggression. Uh, and that makes a home safer by the fact that the, 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 the potential attacker cannot know what means the victim might have at their disposal to resist their intrusion into their home. Uh, if the government does not have that kind of information, which you're saying as well, if, if, if it was not having to be licensed and registered and reported on to the government, uh, the government officials themselves would have to be concerned as to what kind of resistance they could uh, be faced with if on whatever uh, basis they choose to, uh, to, to break into someone's home because they suspect him of something uh, such as, oh, he has undesirable literature or he's criticizing the government or he's part of an association that attempts to oppose the policies or, 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 or ideology of the government. Uh, ju just as a private criminal has to wonder what means of self-defense the owner of the residence has, uh, it would be good if the government had to worry about those things as well. Yeah, that is a great point. I mean, it's like concealed carry is that um, that when some people, when everyone has the right to, to carry a concealed weapon, some people may object and say, no, I don't want to have anything to do with guns or whatever. But it actually makes them safer, too, because the robber doesn't know who's armed and who isn't armed. And Correct. As you point out, it's the same thing with homes. You don't have to have guns in your homes. But they don't know who has guns in their homes. And so it Correct. makes everybody safer. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. On that note, we'll wrap things up. Uh, thank you all again for tuning in. If you like our work, uh, including with respect to gun rights, uh, we invite you to support our work at the Future of Freedom Foundation. You can go to the donation page at FFF.org. Also, if you're not already doing so, subscribe to our FFF Daily, our monthly journal, Future of Freedom. Of course, this YouTube channel. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you all next week. And Richard, I look forward to um, bannering with you next week as well. Until next time.